Hello and welcome to episode 2 of Diary of a Security Consultant. Uh, follow on from last week's episode, which is the first, very, very well received. Uh, so thank you to everybody who sent in comments and, and uh, queries and stuff that they'd like to see covered. And even for those of you who sent in tips and feedback on how to do podcasts and videos and stuff like that, that I obviously am not uh, aware of. So uh, great feedback, like I said, we've got a number of questions come in, a couple of topics that people want to see videos on that I'm really interested in doing. Actually, there's stuff that I would have never, never thought of doing. Um, <clears throat> we've got a couple of questions in. So first we're going to do some questions in from last week. Um, Go through a little bit of what's happening this week. We have some announcements to make and some stuff that's upcoming and stuff like that. A little bit about our topic of the week, which was uh, emergency planning and principle-based training that we did our article on, and most importantly on our AAA uh, principle system. Uh, and then a little bit about ne next week's article and what we're going to do next week. And maybe a little bit of uh, pre-information about a competition that we've got coming up as well. So to start off with, um, I asked last week if anybody had any questions or anything like that that they would like me to cover, if they wanted to send them in. Uh, I got a couple of questions sent into the email and one sent into the, the Facebook page. Two are actually about the same thing. So the first one was about uh, rates of pay uh, in the industry, uh, and it came from a guy who is currently working in a, a like a, a resource uh, community environment, um, and he's been asked to go and get a PSA license, and his rate of pay is currently below the minimum ERO rate, uh, and he asked, is he entitled to the ERO rate of 1165 an hour. Short answer is no. Um, maybe some people aren't aware of this, but the ERO rate as set out by the state only applies to contract security companies and employees of contract security companies. It doesn't apply to directly employed security staff. Now, in saying that, most directly employed security staff are paid around that rate or probably higher anyway, but there's no obligation on an employer uh, who directly employs security to pay that ERO rate. All they have to pay is the national minimum wage as covered by the National Minimum Wage Act, which I believe is going up shortly. Uh, <clears throat> so that answers that question. Another question came in about uh, criminal record checks. It's somebody who's considering going for a license and he asked, um, he has a, a, a criminal record, he didn't say what it was about, but he said, does this automatically disqualify from, from holding a license? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the Private Security Authority have what's called the Fit and Proper Guidelines, which is guidelines that they've issued to say various different types of offences, what the, uh, the outcome was and how long they will hold that against you. Generally speaking, how, they, how that works is that they, uh, they take into account what your sentence was and it's uh, they take their disqualification period from the end of your sentence. So let's just say you got a, a two-month a two sentence in prison, but you only actually did two weeks. They take the start of the disqualification period from the end of the two months that you originally got. Say if you got probation, if you're on probation for two years, your disqualification period doesn't start till after that two years finishes. Um, they have, I'll link it in the show notes here, they have a guide to this, and it lists, like I said, all of the offences, how likely, likely or unlikely you are to get that. Uh, there's also an appeals process uh, to them, and then there's an independent appeals process, so if your license is thrown out. Uh, now, I know there's, 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 there's a bit of disagreement on that in the industry. Some people would say, if you have a criminal record, you couldn't be working in security, or you shouldn't be working in security. Uh, I don't personally agree with that. I know lots of people who made mistakes when they were younger. It uh, doesn't make them hardened criminals. doesn't make them criminal masterminds. They made a mistake. They got caught. They got punished. And they are fine upstanding members of society. They are working in the industry and they are absolutely fine. I would have no crimes in, in working with them or, or trust issues or, or, or anything like that. But to answer the question, it doesn't automatically disqualify you. But if you look at that guide, it will, it will certainly give you a, a guide to it. And don't be afraid to give them a ring either if you can get them to, to answer the phone. Uh, so this week what we've got happening, busy week of training, we've been uh, training all week, uh, we've also had some other stuff on the side, we're currently having a large sporting organisation uh, with some of its access control policies um, for its, its, its offices and its staff and long walking and, and, and stuff like that. Um, we're finalising our company profile, we're doing a lot of work this week on, on something that's kind of becoming more and more important to me, but I've done a couple of tenders in the last couple of weeks for my own bits of work and stuff like that, and some, uh, something that's come up quite common that I see a lot of security companies moving towards is uh, efforts to become a sustainable uh, company, you know, more and more companies out there are becoming more socially and, and environmentally aware, and a lot of what I'm starting to see now is the the advantage that you can gain from being a sustainable company. So we're looking at our own kind of policies and procedures around that, around how we, we, we make ourselves more environmentally aware, more sustainable, more community focused, 
uh, and what we actually do for the, for the for the good of the industry itself and for the environment and for culture itself. So we're looking at things like our, our own travel policies, uh, how we how we deal with waste, uh, our own carbon emissions and things that we can do to, to reduce that. And I see it as a real opportunity for, for us as a company to, to take things forward because the, the, a lot of our clients now are starting to become more aware of it and they're, they're looking for if contractors can support them in doing that then all the better and I think it's an area for security companies into the future that they could really look at it, how to become more sustainable and more environmentally and corporately uh, responsible into the future you know uh, so that's something we're looking at this week uh, we were also made aware this morning uh, that we've been accepted as a contributor and as a I suppose a member of the professional, the Security Professionals Directory, which is uh, based in the United States, but it's a global network of security consultants and security managers uh, who contribute articles to this forum every week. So I've put out an article about that this morning. I'll link it in the links, but we're, we're obviously delighted to be recognised as somebody who deserves to be in there with those security consultants and security experts from around the world. And also, I'm not sure if it's this week or next week, I'll have to double check in with Rollo and Mike in the Professional Security uh, Officer magazine, but we submitted an article in December for their January issue, which is on uh, how organisations make buying decisions for physical security measures and talk about things like it has to fit in with their culture and cost and stuff like that. And I'm looking forward to that coming out and seeing what the reaction is. Uh, according to all the things I've seen on social media, I'm really looking forward to this edition of the Professional Security Officer, which is always fantastic, but this one seems to have a, a real breadth of contributors from around the world. So we're looking forward to see where we kind of fit in with that and then reading the other, the other articles. So that's this week in a nutshell. Uh, our article of the week went out early this week. Uh, it was on principle-based training, which is something that's quite close to me. Uh, it's something I've always believed in. Um, I mentioned in the, the article Rory Miller's book, Meditations on Violence, which I highly, highly recommend to anybody in the security industry. Rory Miller is a person who worked in corrections in the States for a long while. He's a, he's a bit of an expert on things like the psychology of violence, and it's, there's no waffle about him. It's just real-world, practical stuff that, that works. I recommend anybody who's in the, in the industry and has to deal with conflict or violence goes and reads his books. He's got a couple there. He's got uh, Meditations on Violence, which is fantastic. Uh, he's got Facing Violence, which is another great book, and he's got Scaling Force, which is one about uh, reason force and the, the different levels of force, uh, and they're all fantastic. He's got some other ones on, on drills and combat drills and stuff like that for martial arts, but mostly for the security industry, I'd recommend those three. But he talks about in his book, Meditations on Violence, uh, strategy and principles being tactics and techniques, and I've often been a, a, an advocate of that. Um, I find in this industry, particularly with entry level training, there's a lot of technique based training. It's, it's kind of like rote learning, it's like maths when you're in school. If this happens, you do that. And I suppose that's probably easy to teach and it's easy to drill into people because you can just repeat, repeat, repeat and hope for the best. But I don't think it does people any favours when they go out there in the industry and they end up working on their own on a site or limited supervision on a site and they have to actually use their own initiative to make to make decisions and they end up lost. So if they come across a, a situation that doesn't fit exactly into what they were told to do, then they've lost the ability to make decisions because they, they don't have principles that they can follow. And I was, was also a big fan of, of, of security principles. And the good thing about principles on a fundamental level is that they give you the opportunity to exercise judgment, skill, previous training, and, and, and your own experiential decision-making, I suppose, and decisiveness in a, in a, in a situation. So I get the example in the article of something as simple as detaining a shoplifter. And when you go on a training course, they generally give you a six or seven step process for detaining a shoplifter. Uh, and that is ideal circumstances, two security, one shoplifter, the person is compliant and they walk back. But it doesn't take into account like multiple shoplifters, shoplifters who are different gender, shoplifters who are different age. Where are you bringing that person? Is it suitable? How close are the guardie? How much have they taken? Uh, it doesn't take any of that and when you have to start factoring that stuff in to make things work it can be quite difficult because there's a fear then about going away from what you were taught and going away from policy and, and, and stuff like that so i've always been a fan of, um, of principle based training now for principles to work i think for security principles to work there's a couple of criteria that i generally go by they have to fit all or the majority of circumstances so they have to be able to apply kind of overarching um they they have to be safe and uh, for the security officer to, to apply. They have to fit within legal, obviously, and regulatory parameters. You know, you can't have people using, exercising judgment and then saying, I just exercise my judgment, but I broke the law in doing so. So they have to fit within legal uh, parameters. And 
I suppose in the in the grand scheme of things, when you start thinking about the principles and how you apply, they have to be easy to remember and easy to apply to situations. So they have to be something that's going to come to head really quickly that you can think of on the spot and apply. So the the system that I've always kind of uh, implemented is, uh, is what's called the AAA system. Now there is others out there. Everybody's heard of kind of John Boyd's OODA loop and stuff like that, which I've done a lot of reading on and stuff like that. I find the OODA loop is very much uh, internal based. Um, the, the AAA one that I use is based much more on uh, external stuff and it doesn't have to be split second decision making, it's when you've got some, some time as well to make some decisions. So AAA stands for Assess, Alert, Action. Uh, so the first part is assessment and probably the, probably one of the largest causes of injuries that I've seen to security staff, in this and injuries that I've seen to security staff over the years, is caused by not so much new but relatively new security staff maybe a little bit of internal pressure to prove themselves, maybe a little bit of external pressure from other people, uh, but they see an incident happening and it's a reactionary response, which is to go straight in and try to deal with that incident. You'll find the more experience that you get, or I find the more experienced guys, are the guys that would stand back and look at an incident first. So most incidents that we deal with in the security industry are not time critical. You will have some time critical ones, like somebody attacking you, etc. That's time critical, you have to make decisions on the spot. Uh, but most, you know, trespasser on a site, two guys fighting on a dance floor, visitor coming to the desk, uh, shoplifter walking around your shop. You've got time to assess these and go through the decision making process. And I'm sure you've all heard the term dynamic risk assessment. It's something that I'll do some more stuff on. I've got my own model for going through dynamic risk assessment and stuff that I like to lose. There's lots out there. Uh, it gives you that time to assess and think through the situations and have a look at what your options are. Uh, in the situation before you win. So I think the first thing before going into any rote learning principle ba or, or, or technique based response is to be able to look at the situation in its totality, all of the factors that are involved and all of the options that you have at your disposal. The next step then is uh, alert. Uh, and again, it's often left out of people's response, which is the reaction response, which is to rush in. Uh, I would always say after the assessment process, there should be the alert process. Who do I need to tell now? about what's happening and about what I'm about to do. You know? And it could be something simple, the alert thing, could be some, let's just say a fire, uh, it could be something as breaking a break glass unit, it could be something as simple as making a radio call, that's the alert, but who do you need to tell that you're about to do something? That's often forgotten, where you will rush in in a reaction response, take an action, and when you're in there realize, oh my God, I'm on my own here. And then it's too late to go looking for, for help because you have to get your way out of it before you can go looking for help. And when we talk about alert, I generally talk about it on two levels. Local alert and general alert. Local alert. Telling the people who need to know right now who are in danger or affected by the incident. So in a fire situation, people in the building. Um, in a fight situation, your colleagues. In an arrest situation, a store manager. In a trespasser situation, your command and control system. Uh, so who needs to know who's going to be affected by it now? And that's the local alert. And then you have also the, the follow-up alert. Being aware of what, who do I need to tell about it afterwards? So when I break the break glass unit in the fire, I have to remember, okay, now I need to make sure that somebody calls the fire brigade. If it's an arrest, it's the Gardaí. If it's a, a trespasser, it's command and control, then the, the Gardaí. If it's a visitor, do I need to let site management know? So it's about going through this process. Before you go, go, go down one course of, of action, it's about, okay, who do I need to tell about it? At what stage? And what is the best method for doing that? And in the article, I put a table with, with considerations for that. You know? And then the final step then is action, actually taking uh, an action. Uh, so on the principle based system, this is where tactics and techniques comes in at the last stage. Okay, what is the most, uh, what is the safest, what is the most effective, what is the most appropriate action? And again, going back to it, it has to fit in with legal and regulatory uh, uh, practice and laws and uh, whatever type of rules you have to follow, apologies you have to follow on your given, given site. But I suppose action can be very much misconstrued. Not every action involves offensive offensive action. Sometimes the action will be to do nothing. Uh, I was speaking with a group here the other day, and, and somebody asked me a group, uh, let, if you get a job working in a bar, he's doing a door supervisor course, and he wants a job working in a bar, and he asked me, well, if I get a job working in a bar, and there's two people walking there, and a fight breaks out with 20 people, how do I break that fight up? And I said to them, sometimes you have to bear in mind that the best action that you can that you can take is sometimes inaction is not doing something. That the best action you can be taking there is making the vast majority of people in that bar who don't want to be involved in violence safe. Adding two more people to a twenty-person brawl doesn't make that brawl any better or 
probably make it worse. You know? So sometimes the best action is inaction, it's to stand back, wait and watch. Sometimes the best action is to take uh, an intervention and sometimes the best action is to call for, for help. That will be dictated by your principles. You know, is it safe? Is it effective? Is it legal? We're going to look at those things and then we're going to say, okay, what's the best course of action that I can take here? Um, best course of action for me is one that uh, increases safety in a situation, brings control and fits with the regulatory reform. And that's deliberately left vague. And it's deliberately left vague so that people learn lots and lots of different options for solving it. But it allows people to use experience, judgment, common sense, and also a little bit of discretion sometimes. Sometimes a little bit of discretion is, is, is required in situations like that. So that was the general theme of the argument. It's got some, some good feedback. Uh, it's also got some negative feedback. People say that, you know, um, it's the fault of people delivering training courses, so people like me, and, and I would say you, you've got a point there, you've definitely got a point. Uh, I try to deliver principle-based training, but particularly on entry-level courses, the problem that you have on entry-level courses is that uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a vicious cycle because companies would say, oh, the people coming off the, it's great to say principle-based training, but the people coming off the entry-level courses don't have principles that they can follow, they have their own techniques and tactics. And I would agree with that. The problem for people on a training course is that you don't have the time or the exposure with people to build up principle-based practice because for principle-based practice to work, you put people in situations that are easy to solve using principles, where you can apply the principles, and then you slowly build up the stress in those incidents so that they find it harder and harder. Build up the stress, shorten the time, change the parameters, bring in variance. The problem on a five-day training course or a six-day training course is that you don't have to, you've got all that, the skills-based stuff and the theory-based stuff to get through, that you don't have time to bring in stress training. So then they go out there to the companies, the companies will say, well, they haven't been trained in these, uh, in these principles. Correct. So therefore, I can't, as a company, put them into stress-related training because they don't have the principles. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. So it's something I've been working on in my own training courses for the last number of years, is bringing in principle-based training and getting people to, rather than just teaching them a step-by-step -step model for doing something, it's giving them some principles and letting them to, to apply. So every time you move into a new area, you might move into something like uh, defamation. You say, okay, uh, we're going to talk about defamation. This is the theory of defamation. Now, can you tell me how you will apply those situations? The, the, the theory that you know and the principles that you have to a situation where a, a gate alarm goes off at a retail shop? Or could you tell me how you would apply it to refusing somebody who you believe has taken drugs at a, at a nightclub door? You know, and, and seeing if they can apply the, the, the principles uh, to the situation. You don't get a lot of time to introduce stress, but at least you're giving the, the companies who they go out and deal with, you're giving them the leg up because they can then introduce more training if they choose. A lot of companies will just go when they have a license or trained, which is a fallacy. But um, it's it, it at least gives them the foundation to go out and start applying judgment as well as as well as rogue learning when they go out there. You know, so that was the, the kind of team of the the kind of team of the argument, and I can see mirrors in, in both sides. But I think it's something as 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 a security uh, industry, I suppose with the level and the speed at which types of threats and types of risks are changing. I think principle-based training is something we're going to have to consider more because we're not going to be able to train people for every single eventuality. So we have to give them principles that they can apply to a lot of uh, eventualities and situations like that. Um, I suppose finally look at things for next week. Uh, we're planning to do another one of these next week. Uh, we've got some good stuff coming up uh, this week. Uh, I'm in college next week. Uh, I've got a couple of things going. Our article next week is on, uh, it's a bit more psychological, it's almost called the Dunning-Kruger syndrome. Some of you know what that is, some of you won't yet. Uh, Dunning-Kruger is basically a, a psychological theory that says that uh, most people are not as good at their job as they think they are. Uh, and they are not as good as their training would lead them to believe because obviously we train in isolated environments, etc., etc. I was talking to some people about it last week. Uh, I was talking to a security consultant about uh, flaws in a, in a business continuity system that he set up. And then I was talking to Dave from, from Basic about that, uh, about how uh, most people in the industry don't uh, are not as good as they, they think they are. So that's next week's article. I think it's going to be a really interesting one. I've got, I've got a couple of viewpoints for it. Uh, we're going to do a product review. I've got a new charger for Christmas for our partner. One of the best presents I ever got, it's a Juku uh, mobile phone charger. I've used it on a couple of protection tasks already. Uh, I've used it for both a client and for myself, and I've used it on a consultancy task to charge up the iPad. Absolutely brilliant piece of kit. We're going to look at that next week. And I'm also hoping, I'm waiting on some prizes to come in from different suppliers, but I'm hoping to be able to announce 
uh, a competition next week uh, to get the podcast and the, the video thing rolling. So we started this week as a video series, last week, sorry, uh, and then we introduced the podcast, and now we have both a video and podcast uh, going for, for this one. Um, so that's what I'm for next week. And also we're looking forward to, in September of this year, we've got Zachary Rugen coming over from Nightclub Security Services to run some seminars, uh, security seminars, their nightclub security training program from the States. So that's going to include things like active shooter training, um, casualty care training, liability and use of force, hospitality and care, stuff like that. It's an amazing program. I'm going to put more details of that in the show notes and stuff. Um, uh, booking is available through Zach's website. Uh, we're looking to fill three courses around the country. Uh, and get as many people up to date there's some fantastic certifications on it I'll be doing some guest speaking on it and it's something that we're really really looking forward to so until next week if you like it like I said give us some feedback tell us what you like tell us what you didn't like tell us if the YouTube video works better the podcast works better uh, if you're on YouTube give us a like and a share um, if you're on Anchor or Spotify give us a, a like and a share uh, and if you're on your Facebook page the security operative give it a like we've got about two and a half thousand people on there Instagram is growing again this week the security operative um, and our LinkedIn page, which has grown again this week, which is one of my goals for this year, is to grow the LinkedIn page a little bit more. Uh, so we're up to over a thousand on that as well. So if you go on there, just give us a like or a follow. Uh, anywhere you can do it, I really do appreciate it. And as always, if you have any contacts, you can get us on uh, the contact page or you can get us through info at securityoperative.ie. Until next week, thank you very much. <laughs>